Hello, my name is Angela Morehouse and I work for the Illinois Nature Preserves Commission. Um, I work in uh, West Central Illinois as a field representative and my principal job duties are protection uh, through conservation easements of uh, high quality natural areas. Uh, this is just kind of a side gig for me. I'm interested in uh, documenting the pollinating insects uh, on our protected sites. The purpose of my study um, is to collect more data on pollinators uh, throughout the state, uh, but specifically in my area. And I wanted to create a research project that's time efficient, repeatable, and shareable because I'm limited uh, on the amount of time I can spend chasing bugs. Um, I decided to do observational work records with photo documentation. Um, I by myself most of the time. I don't have a big staff, um, but I do uh, photograph all bees, butterflies, and skippers. I record other um, insects that are actually likely to be uh, contributing to pollen exchange. So beetles, flies, wasps, true bugs, and like things like scorpion flies, lace wings, um, and a few others. I do multiple surveys per year. Um, this is a, I'm reporting on four years of surveys. I'm going to do a, a full five years. Um, my routes cover are four times a year uh, through the different floral seasons. I run meandering transects. So I can basically walk through a site and visit the different floral patches because I want to find the bugs where they are. Um, so I want to find those pollinators and document them. I spend a minimum of 60 minutes per transect and up to uh, 90 minutes. Sometimes the if I'm traveling a, a trail, a pre-established trail, so I don't want to bushwhack. Um, sometimes that trail to be a loop takes a little longer or sometimes I just see so many uh, that it's hard to end after 60 minutes. I've got more to record. Uh, my study sites are primarily in West Central Illinois. Uh, my office is located uh, over here on the on the bend the corner of uh, Iowa and Missouri there. And some of these other sites are within uh, two, two and a half hours. They're all permanently protected as nature preserves or land and water reserves within the Illinois Nature Preserve system. Um, I do not have any opposition towards people who collect voucher specimens, and I want these people to continue to do that because we need those to cross-reference with the photographs that we take. However, I do not have the time and I do not really have the personality or the staff uh, to be able to spend hundreds of hours identifying um, lab specimens. So for me, uh, the use of non-lethal surveys and to use photography and just observational records works. I've been doing butterfly surveys for 25 years and that's what I've done for the butterfly surveys, the meandering transects and the photographs. And then with iNaturalist and Bug Guide, the ability to store and share the data uh, with others who can help with identification and to go back and see where this stuff has been documented has really been useful. I didn't have that 25 years ago when I started, but thank goodness we have iNaturalist and Bug Guide and they're wonderful tools. I'm going to say this again. I love iNaturalist. I'm a big groupie for iNaturalist and I use it multiple times a day. Um, it's, it's really hard when it goes down. Um, which isn't very often, fortunately, but it does allow one to upload the photographs and to share with the worldwide biological community. And there are a lot of experts that get on there and help. It's not just your know, crowdsourcing. I mean, everybody can see your photographs, um, but there's a lot of really competent entomology experts out there helping to confirm or correct the identifications. And iNaturalist itself has um, AI where it, the computer actually will tell you what it thinks it is. And sometimes that's great for certain groups of insects and sometimes it's totally off, but I keep hoping that iNaturalist computer will continue to learn the more photographs that we upload. Uh, a lot of us also use Bug Guide as a cross-reference to iNaturalist. Uh, Bug Guide's been around a little longer. It's based out of, uh, of Iowa, uh, I think Iowa State, and it's only for the United States and Canada. Um, but it basically has a lot of high quality photographs. If you basically don't crop your photo and it's blurry, it's not a high quality image, um, they will kick it out. Um, so you're just getting the best quality of images. And originally, Bug Guide, all of the experts, uh, the anthropology experts were on Bug Guide uh, helping to uh, ID. As Nine Naturalist develops and more and more photographs are uploaded to iNaturalist because of the mapping and the AI, um, the experts are actually starting to use both now. A lot of them are going to iNaturalist first and they're still checking bug guide when they can. Um, so that's been a great source. iNaturalist is also really good for meeting people and sharing and asking questions. You have the ability to reach out and contact these experts and ask them more specific questions or tag them. Hey, what do you think of this is? Am I right on this identification? Uh, well, I also love iNaturalist because it allows you to pinpoint more exact locations 
uh, for the species. My camera doesn't automatically upload where I am, um, but it does upload the date and the time and everything. But this species in particular, the, uh, the yellow bee balm fairy bee, um, I found uh, three sites in Illinois. Uh, so far, I'm the only one that's documented this in Illinois. It's a very, very tiny bee. Um, but it's also the nearest site has been in, um, along the west coast there, like Michigan and in Michigan. So it's kind of good information to be able to share with others as to where I'm finding this little guy. Uh, the goals for my study, uh, primarily I was trying to collect baseline species list for the pollinators on these different protected sites. I really want to know what's there. I want to document the plant pollinator associations. So when I see a pollinator on a particular plant, I record that. Um, invasive species, is there any impact of the invasive honeybees or um, invasive uh, plants that they may be visiting? Uh, specialist pollinators, uh, this so far is the only little fly, this thick head fly, the only insect I have documented on lop seed. Lop seeds are really common with an understory plant uh, in Western Illinois, but it just doesn't have a lot of visitors to it. So this clown-like bee um, was, was found on that. Um, I also want to know the rare plants and the rare community types. Are there certain, you know, pollinator insects that, that are associated with those? And the influence of our management, our prescribed burn on invasive species control, our brush clearing, what impact does that have on our pollinators? Uh, so like I say, the first thing I'm doing is baseline. I really want to know what's out there. I want to know what the diversity is, uh, what the richness is. So, so far in the first four years, I have 642 taxa which I'm trying the best I can to identify everything down to species, but in some cases, especially with bees, we can only get to subgenus with a photograph. Um, in the case of flies, there's a, a lot of flies I can identify uh, to species level, but there are a few that have to be left at family level or, or you know, tribe or something like that. We get as far as we can, but I do try to describe them and try to identify them as what I think are separate species. Based on that, Waspies, beetles, flies are all making up about a fifth of the total of pollinating uh, insects that I'm seeing on the sites. Now, when it comes to abundance, this is all the individuals that I'm counting. Uh, 16,901 uh, bees made up a lot bigger portion. So there's a lot of bees out there, of course, visiting flowers because that's what bees do. Uh, some of these others, you know, beetles will do, you know, some of the beetles will do both. Certainly wasp. A lot of wasps are predatory, so that some feed on flowers and eat things. And you know, same thing with flies. Uh, they'll they have a variety of different uh, food types. Um, so bees are the big big one. Wasp. Now I was seeing a big diversity of wasp. You know, about a fifth uh, of the pie. But when it comes to the individuals of wasp, because they're so solitary, many of them, I'm only seeing a few individuals per species, and therefore the percentage of total wasp is a lot lower compared to the other groups. Uh, tax of richness and abundance per site. I want to know how my different sites are doing. Uh, some have a lot more. Uh, all of them had quite a few um, species or, or taxa. So that was kind of good to know. Our sites are, are basically critical for a diversity of pollinators. Now the abundance, of course, is a lot higher in some of the higher quality sites. Um, and that was nice to know. But it's it was really amazing to me that my lowest one was 102 uh, different taxa. Uh, for my worst site. Uh, plant associations. I've documented uh, as of the end of four years, 242 plant species that were visited by these insects pollinators. And these are the top five. They're not too exciting for a botanist, uh, but Canada goldenrod is so abundant on the landscape. 126, I think, different uh, insect visitors. Uh, wild parsnip had 96. I know we don't like to hear that, but wild parsnip is very popular for a lot of different flies and wasps. And there's a lot of things that can go to a wild parsnip because it's the pollen and nectar are easily accessible. It's a promiscuous flower. They like a lot of things from the carrot family. We don't have as many native carrots out there. So they're going to the non-native weeds. I have one site in particular that just had a ton of parsnip and that boosted uh, the amount of, of pollinators on there. Daisy fleabane, weedy little thing, but it blooms for a long duration. So we have multiple sightings of insects on that. Uh, mountain mint's probably the only one that I would actually encourage people to plant. Uh, really, really good for pollinators. Uh, white snake root uh, is basically a weed in the forest, uh, but it is heavily used by a lot of different species of pollinators. 
There appears to be some relationship between the amount of native plants versus the amount of native insects, as one would expect. Um, this trend line looks pretty good. That first one right there, uh, that had a lot of wild parsnip on it. Uh, so a lot of the insects were visiting wild parsnip at that particular site. Um, so it'll be interesting to, to, to see how this trend shakes out with the rest of the years. Invasive impacts. There are a lot of honeybees at these sites. Almost every site had honeybees on it. However, they were present in such low numbers that I don't think they're having an impact in taking the resources from the natives. I think the natives are still able uh, to get sufficient resources as long as the flowers are there. The biggest issue with honeybees is that they are visiting a lot of non-native plants and therefore they're helping to contribute to the germination of the seeds. And so we're getting higher seed production because of the presence of honeybees. Uh, and that is a problem. We've got a lot of feral hives that are within sometimes our nature preserves and just on the border of our nature preserves. And that is remains a concern. Oligolectic bees and other, uh, oligolectic ter is a term used for bees and it essentially means the bee is visiting one particular uh, genus or species, occasionally family of plant and that is their preferred plant. A lot, a lot of bees are really specific to which ones they use, especially these mining bees, these andrinas. Uh, about a third of all the insects I recorded were found on only one or two um, types of uh, flowers. However, in some cases they were only seen, you know, once or twice. Um, so that's hard to determine whether that's a specialist or not uh, based on other information we know. Um, there are a lot of specialists out there, but over half of them are probably generalists. The importance of remnant plant communities. Um, remnants offer rare plants. The insects seem to like the plants wherever they are, which is good news for reconstructions. If you want to reconstruct a prairie from a, a former crop field, um, if you plant the plants, if the insects are still in the area, they will find it. The importance of the remnants is that provides a seed source for those insects to come into your reconstruction. Remnants are a vital source of those insects to seed that area. Uh, there's been some experiments trying to move insects around. It's a lot easier if they can get there on their own than you try to move them. Impacts of management. Uh, we divide the management into three different um, sections. So high intensive, moderate to low, and no management. Some sites were not able to do management. They're small sites. The private landowner may not want management or it's simply just not a priority. Um, but in most cases, it's because the landowner just refuses to allow us and that's okay. Uh, that's part of our easements. We don't force people to uh, let us burn if they don't want us to burn, at least at this time. Uh, high intensity management, uh, at least two burns every five years, plus brush clearing and invasive control uh, within that period of time. And those burns are usually fairly hot. Uh, moderate to low intensity, be one or two burns every 10 years. Some of those burns can be pretty cool with limited clearing and some invasive work. So insect abundance based on those, it's interesting because the Natural History Survey in Illinois is also uh, looking at management for uh, butterflies and skippers and leaf hoppers. And they're seeing similar results in that the high intensive management does seem to be a little higher for insect diversity and insect abundance than the lower management sites. However, it's not statistically significant. In my case, one of the issues we had was that two sites had, are outliers. They had a lot of native plantings. And so that just screwed that because a lot of insects were going to the native plantings rather than the communities. Same thing with taxa richness. You see a little bit higher and high intensity, not statistically significant. And you have one outlier on the same site where it was planted. Future plans. Um, I'm finishing up the fifth year of surveys. I did a few more sand prairies and some isolated cemeteries um, in 2022. I'm going to complete the analysis of land cover for all 30 sites, compare richness, abundance for each insect order and the vegetative community kite to see if there's difference on a large landscape scale. And then in 2023, I'm going to start reevaluating these the same five sites, six sites every year, again for the next five years. I'm going to continue to gather information on what they're visiting, ENT, endangered and threatened uh, uh, insects for, found in Illinois and on the rare plants. So here's just an example of my land cover. I'm basically getting some help uh, from GIS mapping guy. Um, we want to know, you know how much, especially grasslands are really, really good for pollinators and open forests that have been managed are really good. Unfortunately, a lot of our managed woodland areas are really small. 
because we can't manage everything. So in the scope of 100, uh, 1,800 meter radius, which is about a mile, that is just my uh, maximum defined distance for effective pollination. I read that in a, a paper somewhere down in South America, and I thought that sounds like a good number. Let's go with it. Um, so that's essentially what I'm looking at from the center of my transect out uh, 1800 meter radius. Um, what is the land cover within those areas? So far, there just doesn't seem to be a lot of relationships, and that might be because I am working so hard to find these insects wherever they are. And if they're not necessarily in my preserve, I'm walking the roadside edge, I'm walking, you know, trails, roads, whatever nearby to find those insects that are using the preserves, but they're coming out. Um, to visit the flowers. So I'm getting a lot of data, a tremendous amount of data, so much that you know I'm, I'm going to be busy the rest of my life on, on pollinator data, which is fine. This is something to do, right? <laughs> I am learning how and why I'm getting a lot more efficient knowing where to look for what different types of insects and what specific species and what plants I'm looking at. I know what plants are the most desirable. I call them candy plants. Which ones are going to attract the most pollinators? As I said, IMPC sites, our protected sites, are definitely serving as critical habitats. So much of the landscape is in private hands. There's a lot of heavy, intense agriculture in the prairie state. Um, so, I mean, everything seems to be surrounded by corn and beans. Um, so these patches of habitat are really important. One thing I'm seeing is that even small little patches could support a high number of insects because of potentially habitat compression. It's all that's left. So the insects are all coming to these little tiny areas holding on. And we'll see, you know, five, 10 years, 10 years, if that holds out in maybe 50 years before they really start falling off, I don't know. Um, but we'll, we'll do what I can to find out. Uh, there's a little difference in richness and abundance between remnants, planted or weedy grasslands. Um, now that's not looking at conservative insects, whether the insects themselves are conservative, that's just looking at abundance and species richness. So the diversity is high, but they may be like soldier beetles and tarnished plant bugs and, you know, really common species. Areas with low densities of flowers, especially dense forests in the summertime, have a lot fewer pollinators because they have a lot fewer flowers. Um, with that, uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, you certainly are, are free to email me. Um, I'm, tr I'm trying to get out there and, and, and make this stuff known. I just want people to get out there with their cameras and start documenting uh, more insects and more pollinators. So I thank you for that.